in this video i'm going to continue my series of videos on the animist and the spirits we're going to learn how the animist can harness the power of a spirit how to negotiate them and how to bind them in order to summon them forth at a later date to do their bidding so grab those fetishes adopt a trance-like state and let's summon that storm spirit to do our bidding. My name's Inwills, and welcome to the In Crowd. Hello and welcome back to my next video in the series all about animists in the rule set which is Mithras. You might have noticed something slightly different about today's video. Yeah? Yeah, got it? Yeah, that's right. I have a new camera. I'm upping the ante in the quality of these videos. Yeah, shame about the content. Anyway, I always knew that this video series was going to be a long one mainly because um, I felt that the other schools of magic were a lot easier to talk about than the animus. Also, um, I we don't have an animus within our campaign, so I've had to do a lot of research and learn the rules myself. However, I do feel that I'm really learning about animus and spirits in order to do these videos for you. And I can safely say that it would be one of my favorite classes of character or schools of magic to play if I was lucky enough to play in a Mithras campaign. Now if you have missed any of the previous videos within this mini series then do go back and check them out. The first one was all about creating the animist itself and the second we went exploring spirits within the spirit world both of these are really helpful to understand how animists will operate within your game. So we have created the animist and we understand about spirits. So let's start putting them all together and see how animists and spirits work together and impact the game. So first up, binding and negotiation. Now, once the animist has found the spirit which they wish to employ, I'm trying not to use the word use. Um, I almost like it makes feel makes me feel as if we are being the spirits are being exploited and unhappy. So I'm going to use the word employ. Anyway, once the animist has the spirit, um, there are two ways they the animist can encourage um, the spirits to aid and assist them. Binding is probably the least dangerous option. Once located, the animist can enter their translite state and start to communicate with the spirit. Now, you have to remember that communication is not available for all animists uh, in the rank of the cult or brotherhood. If this is the case and the um, animist cannot communicate to um, with the spirit because of their rank, then a higher ranking shaman can be a conduit um, for the follower. OK, then. so how do you deal with negotiation? Well, basically, it's up to you as a GM, although it could involve some social skills or magical skills to convince the spirit to enter into a service for the animist or it could be the result of some role playing or some current situation in the game. You do need to remember that spirits will not always be prepared to negotiate with anyone. That raging storm spirit has only one thing on its mind and it's not having a friendly chat. So once the service has been decided upon, the animist has to complete a service in return for the spirit. Again, this could be part of the adventure or played out with the player and GM um, outside of the game. 
Alternatively, you could sort of like adopt a more abstract method for repaying the spirit. This involves the animus providing the number of experience rolls equal to the spirit's intensity multiplied by the number of years needed to complete the service. Of course, generally this might just be multiplied by one. I really like the experience role method for repayment but in but in the downtime when the animist is repaying the spirit I think I would encourage the player to provide some kind of narrative of what happens between um, within the game um, so it can be added to the depth of the character and the player's role playing. Okay, so that's negotiation done. What about binding? But there are some spirits who are not interested in negotiating with anyone. Um, this, is, Because of this, these spirits are not actually out of the reach of the animist. What the animist has to do is force the spirit into service by using a binding. Now, in order to be successful with a binding, the uh, uh, animist has to enter into spirit combat with the spirit and either gain a special, um, which is called compel bargain, or reduce the spirit to zero magic or tenacity points, depending which resource you're using in the game. If either of these conditions are met, then the spirit is bound to the animus for future service. Remember, the spirit's power cannot exceed the limit set by the animus binding skill, being three times the critical range of this skill. I must apologize at this for, uh, point in time. I have a stripy shirt on and it seems to be doing that weird thing with moving lines. Anyway, back onto animus and spirits. Let's talk about spirit combat. I'm going to deviate from the order in the rule book um, the, in order to deal with spirit combat before going into how to create a binding etc. Now unless you're going to be super nice to your animus and let them negotiate with all spirits the sp then spirit um, combat is definitely on the card somewhere. Now, this sort of combat works exactly the same as physical combat with the spirit using its spirit combat skill and the animist using their binding skill. Generally, spirits only engage with people with a binding skill, although in my campaign this has not always been a, the case. Haunts, one of my favourite types of spirits, do not limit their attacks to those who can only defend themselves. If the opponent doesn't have a binding skill, then they are reduced to just using their willpower. Now, the combat progresses in the same way as physical combat, with the combatants using action points to attack and defend. The differential role system is used, and where dictated, either side can receive a combat special. You can find these on page 138 of the core rulebook and include the previously mentioned compel bargain. Damage is taken on magic points or tenacity points, whichever you are using in your campaign. If things go badly, animists can withdraw from spirit combat by using an action and rolling their trance skill against the spirit spectral combat role. If they succeed, then the animist spirit returns to their body and combat is over. Those without a trance skill cannot flee from spirit combat and will definitely need rescuing or will be thrashing unconsciously until their will is completely consumed by the spirit. So what happens if the magic points or the tenacity of either the um, spirit or the animus reduces to zero? Well, there are many effects um, being, of being reduced to zero points via combat, some rather unpleasant for the human to be involved in. These range from possession to causing the spirit to be ripped away from the physical body and destroyed or set to wander the spirit plane. You can find all the possible effects on page 138 of the core rulebook, but 
for us, we are going to assume that the animist has been successful with either a compelled service bargain special or the animist reduced the spirit's magic or tenacity points to zero. Okay, on to bindings, those fetishes that adore the um, animist um, person. So once the animist is in control of a spirit, then they can bind it to a binding or fetish. These come in three options. The spirit can be bound to a fetish, um, a location or even a creature. Um, the preparation of these bindings can be found starting on page 135 of the core rulebook. I'll come back to these in a future video, but for now I want to focus on the animist and them using their bound spirit. Now, the animist can have a number of bound spirits related up to relating to their charisma score and their rank in the Brotherhood. So a follower, the lowest rank, can have a quarter of their charisma. Spirit worshipper, half the charisma. Shaman, three quarters of the charisma. And high shamer, all their charisma. The animist summons a spirit from their binding by rolling their binding skill and using one magic point. The roll can include various effects if the animist scores a critical or a fumble. A critical success means that the command is not only successful but costs the um, animist no magic points. However, a fumble, the command is so badly botched, the binding is broken, allowing the spirit to return to the spirit plane or to turn onto the animist if the spirit was hostile. If the spirit comes from a fetish, um, it will appear in a free action. Returning the spirit to the binding requires an action, action point, but no further use of magic points. If the spirit is within the spirit world, then uh, the spirit, the animist needs to perform a trans, -like, trans skill well to enter the spirit world and communicate with it. This will allow the animist to summon a spirit which has been previously negotiated with or a spirit which the animist knows the spirit's real name. Obviously, spirits like to keep these rather secret. In the latter case, the animist needs to use a binding skill to ensure that the spirit cooperates with the animist. The result of this role can be found at the top of page 137 and depends on the opposed role between the animist binding skill and the spirit's willpower. The score of the initial role also indicates when the spirit will arise ranging from a critical success, meaning that the spirit anticipates the summon and arise quickly, to a fumble, meaning that the spirit has been annoyed and will not summon or serve until the animus makes amends. Now, before we get into what spirits can do for the animus, please consider liking, commenting and subscribing to the channel. I produce regular videos about Mithras as well as actual play videos and personal blogs. Soon I will be um, producing some videos about GMing, so why not subscribe and press that bell button in order to get a notification when my next game, my next video goes live. Also, if you would like to provide some additional support, if you know what I mean, then the link is in the Patreon account below as well. Also, if you're interested in any of the adventures, um, I do provide a behind the scenes video of how I created this scenario and how I thought it went and my adventure notes um, at the end of every four or five sessions. The video is called Adventure Reflections and can be found on this channel, while the adventure notes are available on my website for a small donation of your choice. You can find my website at inwills.co.uk. Okay, back to spirits and those animists. Okay, so your spirits are organized and bound into your um, fetishes and you are heading off with your party. What can you achieve with your spirits in your role of the animist? 
Okay, I have to fess up at this point and say that I've never actually played an animist or had one in my campaign. So if I get anything wrong here, do let me know. And I know you will. Okay, animists can use the spirit's powers in three ways, augmentation, embodiment, and abdication. Okay, first up, augmentation. The simplest and safest spirits are nature and guardian spirits who augment the animist. The spirit gives the practitioner, the animist, a benefit by flowing through or around their body and then is easily returned to the fetish. This would allow the animist to benefit from the spirit's abilities. So for example, if the spirit has the ability of warding, this will all this will surround the animus and protect them. In a similar way, the spirit can use bless ability to augment a skill or attribute. The amount of that the skill and attribute can be modified by is actually detailed in the spirit's ability called curse. You can find a table located on page 143 of the core rulebook. I imagine that this would be the most common way for spirits to support the party. If you are an expert on spirits, hope Pete Nash is watching. Can the animists ask spirits to augment other people, I wonder? So next up, embodiment. This is the active task of assimilating a spirit's powers and advantages into the animist physical being, directly channeling and becoming one with the spirit. Elemental or shape-shifting spirits work in this way. Embodiment can be risky and demanding. A weak animus who um, embodies, uh, gets embodied by a spirit can have the risk of being consumed by the spirit itself or even entra being entrapped in its own body. However, this embodiment would allow the animus to shape shift or even spirit's endowment abilities or animate. Although your GM might consider animate as an augmentation power, I'll let you decide. And finally, abdication. This is where the animus surrenders control, surrenders control of their body by willingly letting himself or herself be possessed. Ancestor spirits, um, details of which can be found on page 143 of the core rulebook, often take over the animist body in order to communicate with the followers or leader of the tribe. As you can imagine, this is a very dangerous pastime. I do wonder what would happen if a rogue animist lets a plague or storm spirit possess them. I also get so many great ideas when I'm making these videos. A rogue animist and totally abdicated to a storm spirit. Mm. If I was starting to play animist within campaign, I think I would carefully introduce the spirits using example ones first before starting to create my own. I really like the concept of the animist and the feel that creative players could really make fantastic use of their spirits. Unlike the other magic schools where power is easily controllable, I feel that there is always a risk involved in animists and that would that always appeals to me. I link them very much to like the street shamans within Shadowrun, although if I was playing the Shadowrun game I would primarily be a rigger. Anyway, I hope you have enjoyed these rule videos on the Animus as much as I have. I have got some more planned for the future about Animus when I explore spirit combat more and look at designing the actual spirits. But until then, I'm going to leave you in your trance-like state and return to the mundane world. So until next time, I hope all your opposed roles are successful and reward you with a well-deserved special which, if you are in spirit combat, I hope you use to compel a bargain. Happy Mithrasing, everyone. See ya. Bye.